uh, the world is a changing and it's changing us for us on individual levels and on our our corporate levels however and so i kind of want to start there because i felt like that was so raw and true and so many people in this industry have been disrupted in various ways not the least of which are very talented new york times best selling authors I, I would love to just kind of go down the line and just talk about what, how, what's that doing to you in each one of your marketplaces, in each one of your companies, or as, as an influencer? Jen, you want to start? Sure. Should I pick this up? I think so. I think it's easier. It's actually tough to follow that because I came in here thinking we had such great things to tell you about what NewsCred is doing for journalism, but when you listen to folks like that, it kind of makes you second guess. Are we doing the right thing? Can, is this on? Yeah. Um, for those of you in the room who don't know NewsCred, we are actually a content marketing technology company, and we, we do a lot of things. We're basically a hybrid of a, a technology company and an agency. So our cl customers are brand marketers like Pfizer and IBM and folks like that, and we help these guys basically use content to drive business outcomes. So a lot of what we do is give them access to editorial content from publishers from whom we license that content and we transform it. We basically pick the needles out of the haystacks of all those great articles that are thematically relevant to what a brand is trying to do and talk about and we give them a way to pull that content together, use it, and I can give you a lot more details on how we do that, and then we funnel back licensing fees to the publishers. Similarly, there's a network of independent journalists that do that are part of our network where we have a, an assignments desk for, on behalf of our customers where they can also create content for those brands. Um, so we have them, and I think that we look at it as a way of supplementing their income so that they can all go on to do the journalism that matters. But I kind of wonder, is it enough? <laughs> right, right, right. And, 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 you know, having worked in the startup culture a little bit, and, and I, won't, I won't steal the thunder first, but, you know, it, I, I think about having worked in that environment where we were with some of the things we thought were going to make money didn't. Some of the things we didn't think we were going to make money did, and we ended up developing lots of different levels of income or, or revenue. So um, maybe talk about that a little bit more later, but why don't you guys pick up on that theme? All right. Well, I, I wanted to go back and say I thought that panel was so good. It was. I, I feel like I have had a, a lucky career. I am the CEO of a media company. We do all sorts of interesting things. And I want to quit my job and be a freelance writer. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that was really just so authentic and so good. And, or I, I wish that they were cartoonists or poets or some of the things that we do so that I could publish some of them. Yeah. I, I guess um, Andrews McMill Universal is this very weird mix. It's an eclectic company. Started off as a traditional content syndicate. Uh, got into traditional publishing. We do calendars and greeting cards. We have a the Hollywood uh, entertainment licensing division. We do lots of digital products that go to consumers and all those different forms of revenue uh, mean very little to me by themselves. I think the worst thing we can do is to kind of siloize the company into one thing. It's, it's having that mix of different things that go together that work. And when I listen to those freelance writers talk about having to be so many different things, I feel like in some way they're the embodiment of what we are as a company. And the magic is really what goes between them. It's, it's the overall brand and, and the, uh, the, the reputation that they have and the talent that they bring and, and the, the fact that they believe so much in themselves. I think what makes us stand apart as a company is that we are not digital first and we're not consumer first. And, to somebody said in the audience, uh, or a speaker earlier said that the audience first is, is the new thing. We're totally creator first. We believe completely in the talent of the creators and treating them well. And everyone who's ever been part of our company, every creator we've ever worked with for 45 years or something like that has stayed with us. And that has served us well across all those different revenue streams. And I'm not sure I answered the specific no, question. No, actually you did. And I think it's, you know, it's evolving, right, John? Yeah, I mean, so I, I'm a little bit different as in I, I, I'm John, by the way, nice to meet everyone. Uh, I own a payments company called Do, do.com. And uh, I'm kind of on both sides because I am both a freelance writer 
uh, in the sense of a lot of publications out here recognize me as a freelancer for their publications, although most publications do not pay me money. I write for more credibility to lead back credibility to my company and drive links back to my company to get more credibility for it to rank better in the search engines and drive more traffic to my company so I monetize by people signing up for my company using our products and services and using that over time. And that's why we put, produce a lot of content. We also hire a lot of freelancers at our company to write posts, write things, and become that flexible freelancer that is out there producing content for us. And we're producing a lot of that. But we actually, we don't run ads. We don't do anything. Our particular goal is to provide information, very, very relative, good information for our customers so that it will attract new customers to our site They'll sign up, use our products, which makes us money. You know, I, I think it's interesting because coming off of that panel, it is interesting because we all are uh, maybe a little bit on the other side of that. I was a, I was a journalist for 20 years, um, then did a startup for five, and, and now I'm doing a lot of what these folks were talking about. But it doesn't seem all that different from our conversation yesterday on the phone about the fact that Dear Abby used to have value, or that there were cartoons that had value, and now they don't. And so I think the challenge in, in disruptive times or in disruptive industries is how do, you know, we heard hustle a lot, that word hustle on that last panel a lot, and yet um, it, it seems like, and not just in journalism, it seems like uh, figuring out where the little pots of money are, and then maybe even, and I was encouraged when I heard, and that led to another pot, and another pot, and an, so there's this sort of serendipitous discovery that happens when you wade in for something that may not seem all that lucrative. Would you agree with that? I mean, is that, is that, is that sort of where you think this is going? I asked two different questions, and maybe you answer that other one differently. All right, well, I'll treat this like a vice presidential debate then and answer whatever question okay. I want to. <laughs> right, right. Um, so things that used to have value that don't. So I'm How not sure. I, what I believe is that distribution models change all the time. That content that has value that, that people connect to is really uh, timeless in many ways. So even some of the, the examples that you gave, there's, there are plenty of old writers, there's plenty of old cartoonists who still have an audience and they just can't be reached in the way that they used to be reached. So to me, it's a question of making sure that you find ways to connect really valuable content with the audience and the more distribution models that we have now, the better for all of us. So I'm, it's not to me that, that something has less value, Jim, than it used to have. It's making sure that we make it available to people in whatever ways they want to receive it. One of the great things about the kind of content that we publish, which has a very tight strategic focus, it's all short form, highly shareable, touches an emotional cord. It's, it's built for social media before social media ever existed. So the fact that we're able to uh, reach people through uh, ways that they want to share with each other allows us to find a, a kind of an equilibrium and a happy medium and a place to distribute that content that's going to work. And usually it works over lots of different distribution uh, vehicles. And that sharing economy is a really, really important Huge. part it's of a, what I'm a, guessing critical. all of you do. You want to you want to pick up on that? Yeah, I mean, uh, sharing economy as in define your definition of sharing economy. Well, I think I it can I look like say, a couple of different things, yeah. but I mean, things that people want to share with their friends that then sort of get get passed down the line. That's one that's one yeah. way to define it. Yeah, I mean, sharing economy for me might be a little bit more towards what news credit. I mean, we do a lot of syndication. I mean, that's what I look at as our sharing economy. I mean, obviously, we're creating, you know, we're sharing out content. We're putting out things, you know, for our audience. Again, mine's a little bit different because I'm a, I'm a business where our company, our sole focus is around getting customers to use our product and our service. And we're putting out all this content for free. Um, to attract that and then we're also again sharing it out on a million different publications a million different platforms to get additional readership to that because that attracts people back to our company that's essentially what your company yeah, does that's so precisely that's precisely what we're helping our customers do so one of the things that stood out that what we do with the journalists that we work with essentially is we will match we play matchmaker and we will match them up with brands 
for the expertise that they have that that brand wants to basically hone in on. But we, what we do, I think maybe it's not super high paid, but there is predictability was a word I think one of them used where these customers of ours are buying a certain flow of content on a monthly basis. So these guys know they're gonna be writing five stories a month or whatnot, and it, is, it does allow them to have that consistent revenue stream that's coming in. To their point about maybe it's not worth much right now, but it could be, do you agree with that? And do you see a way where, um, you know, we were talking about uh, really reaching very deterministic audiences who really want that content, the, the whole thousand user follower. Can you see that raising that? I could see that. We thought about um, actually taking our marketplace and, and turning it on its side, reverse, basically letting th those guys license their content back to our distribution network. If there's a business there, we haven't really put all of the, uh, the details down, but that, that's a possibility that they can reach lots of other places with that content in another way to make revenue. Um, I can see them going on to work with those brands and bigger and better things. And some of them actually have developed close relationships with those brands that they're working for already and want to do bigger and better and more and more, frankly, to the point where they'll probably go off and work together and just cut us out of the middle. Sure, <laughs> and, and build their own personal right. brand, right? Yeah. Correct. Andy? So uh, with, with a caveat that, that we're more of an entertainment company than a journalism company, I think the answer to your question is absolutely. And it all depends on the originality and the authenticity of the talent. So the example I'm thinking of right now, we happen to publish, and I'm amazed to be saying this, we, we published the number one selling book in the country in 2017 of all books, and it's a poetry book. Who in their right mind would have thought a poetry book would have been the number one selling book in the country? And by the way, that same author just did a live event at a big uh, theater in Tribeca last Monday night, sold out the show with $250 a ticket. P her second book just came out and it's now the number one seller on Amazon and in Barnes and Noble already. It's a poetry book. We found her online, she self-published. We paid her $5,000 was the initial advance for the book. And oh my God, she, she believed ROI herself. was okay. It was okay. <laughs> and, f and pretty good for her too. Pretty good for her too. Right, right. <laughs> and, and yet that seems like it's the exception rather than rule. But, but you brought up a word that I think is really key and that is authenticity. And, and I think that you know what I heard on the panel before was these people that had really deep passions. And we are all working through troughs right now in terms of revenue. I, I, I don't, I mean, Nobody in the industry is not touched by the trough that is the revenue stream, right? Uh, and in that transition, and you want to say, hold on, stay with it, right? Um, and, and there's an example of that. Do you see that as becoming sort of one of the standards of, of how to break through and get to the other side and to prosperity in this? Or no, is that too philosophic? I mean, because it, you know, a couple of you, sorry. Um, I have backgrounds in, in journalism. I mean, d deep backgrounds in that, so. I would say yes, it is. Mm. Stretch. Uh, that's just me personally, and I, I would say like that happens every now and then, but that's a unicorn. How often do we see unicorns? I mean, how often have you hit the number one book out there in 2017? Can only happen once. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but other years? No, no it's rare, but, but yes, I, I, I think I, I guess, again, I'll try to answer my own question instead of specifically that one, but I try not to pay too much attention to revenue on a regular basis, even though, I mean, it's sort of an, a silly thing to say, but there's so much noise that goes on in revenue that you only want to look at it once in a while. What you want to look at is whether or not something is catching on in some way and whether or not whatever that is has, can be monetized in lots of different ways. So, yes, I look at revenue periodically, but I'm, I'm much more interested in other metrics that show something's working across distribution channels. I mean, sp speaking towards the revenue, I know, uh, I mean, this isn't us, obviously, we pay attention to revenue. Uh, from our perspective, we, we have certain metrics that our authors have to hit, and if they don't hit them, we pay them less. Um, and obviously, if people hit certain metrics, we pay them more, but I, I know of a lot of different publications. For example, me personally, I write for Ian Contrepreneur, Forbes, Mashable, TechCrunch, and a million other sites, right? Just because, again, I'm trying to build my brand, 
build everything out there that but there's a lot of publications who are even um, looking at their contributors and looking at the bottom line of their contributors and saying we have an editor that has to take this amount of time so if it doesn't hit a certain amount of page views we're not even going to accept a free piece of content so at some point you do have to look at the numbers because if you're just putting out content 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 and it's not actually hitting specific numbers it's not worth your time I, I look at that from a business perspective but also understand that as a freelancer that that's going to happen as well so we uh, again it's kind of numbers we're digging a little bit deeper and actually paying for performance in maybe a little bit of a different way so a lot of what news credit is trying to do right now is is actually would be helpful to you what you're trying to do is so prove the actual user journey with that content to prove and connect the content to revenue, to an actual business outcome for that brand. And we will get there. It's very difficult. I think we're laying the infrastructure for how to do that, and it's different for every brand and what their goals are. But it, it's going to be different for a B2B brand than it is for a, you know, a Pepsi. How do, you, how, do you, how do you prove that that content drove people into stores to buy Pepsi? So it's, it's a ways before we get there, but there are definitely brands that we are close to doing that with today. And the plan is that when you can actually tie that, we will charge them a lot more and we will pay out bonus you know, revenue to the creators of that content. And that's where we're trying to take the whole thing. So there's a base for the content creation, but there's also a bonus when it performs. That whole idea of um, performance, of that e you can have passion, you can do something, uh, you can even be authentic, but, but at some point there's a, there's a performance hinge to it. That, um, that seems very much uh, a driving force now right. in all content. But, but a lot of that is the time frame. I think that the key is having uh, the long view. And, and if you've got somebody supporting your company, I used to work for David Bradley at Atlantic Media. He badly wanted that company to transition across the digital divide and he was willing to spend the money and the time to do it. And having somebody like that willing to support journalists that he believed in is what made that happen. If you were looking at that in a you know, quarterly basis, a lot of other people would have folded that. And, and David's not the only example. There's plenty of, of companies that do have a longer perspective towards metrics, especially revenue. Who here does not have metrics associated with their job uh, or their publication that they work for? Does anybody not have metrics assigned to them? So I think that's interesting because in journalism, that, uh, that wasn't necessarily part of the equation, and yet now it very much is. So we get back to that sort of proof of performance thing. Um, and each one of you have said that, that at some point that, that definitely matters to you. I mean, if you're a journalist and you go spend you know, a week on a story and it's the most amazing story in the whole world and only 10 people read it online, you know, you can't have that many of those before your publication goes out of business or before you end up not having that same position. It, it, sometimes the, the whole discussion of content, um, is, especially in a journalism school, is a little tough because uh, it's not the same breath, right? It's not the same thing. Um, and yet, um, I've kind of gone from journalism to now teaching content marketing. Talk a little bit about the journey, the consumer journey, and about connecting with users on that. For the marketer, while, while essentially these marketers have become publishers a little bit in, in the behavior, but the end result they're trying to achieve is extremely different. So unlike a publisher who's trying to drive a ton of eyeballs and a ton of page views to sell advertising against, marketers aren't trying to do that. They're trying to reach the right audience and they only care about the right audience and then basically drive them down the funnel or what we call the consumer journey so content goes out it's bringing people in but then you want to bring people back you want to basically get those those customers to identify with the brand and it's especially important for brands who sell things that are commoditized because why are you going to buy theirs over something else a lot of it now is trying to teach what the brand is actually about um, and offer some kind of value exchange to those users. But the end result is as they come down, you want them to take some kind of action, whether it's sign up for a newsletter, download a white paper, attend an event, um, and ultimately, you want to generate leads to the sales team so that that brand can actually sell products and improve revenue. 
that came from that user or prove that they bought their product or e-commerce is an easy one to prove that they went over to the e-commerce version of your site and they purchased a product. So that, that's kind of what we call the funnel and then the content at the top is what drives them down that funnel. I'm, I'm curious, one of the things at a journalism school that I don't think that we teach enough of is, is this sort of entrepreneurial business, hey, you could be out there on your own, that part of the business, but also the part that says, what is going to compel someone to consume your content? What do you want them to do as the result of that? And, and, and I know that, you know, we start in journalism, and, and my wife and I talk about this a lot because she teaches here as well, about what is the intent of your piece of content. And with journalists, we start with the truth, right? But, but usually with a lot of what you guys are doing, you're looking for, for something else. You're, you're, you definitely have a plan in play. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that. You did. I mean, uh, for me, uh, like journalistic and doing that, I mean, it's all about page views. Like, I, I hate to keep going back to that, but if I have this journalistic where I'm taking a week to write a piece, it's a heavy in-depth piece and nobody reads it, like, I'm going to be fired after a while. Um, kind of, I, I wanted to touch on a point of your, the entrepreneur uh, thing, I, I, audience question. Uh, how many of you work from home? Okay, so maybe like 15, 10, 15% of the room. Do you guys know by 2020, it's estimated 50% of the US population will work from home? Do you guys realize? 2020, 50% of the US population will work from home. So if that says anything about like future of work mm -hmm. and how a lot more of us will and, and freelancers, too, are, are going up by millions and millions and millions. We, we did a research thing at the beginning of last year, and it was 54 million. There's 54 million freelancers. And then we did another one six months later, and it was up to 62 million. Like, that was six months later, and there was an additional, like, five, six million freelancers that actually identified themselves as freelancers. So, like... That's a huge shift in the workforce, a huge shift of what's going to happen with journalism in that perspective from people all working from home. How do you interview, you know, it's no longer going into an office and doing all this research. It's, oh, we've we got to go figure out where that guy lives and go talk to him in his pajamas. Hopefully he's not in his pajamas. I don't always work from in my pajamas, so. But sometimes you do. And sometimes. Oh, just interesting facts about like what's coming up in the future and like future of like business and work will dictate a lot of I think the and like what's happening with like companies like mine who invest so much in content. We're trying to outrank publications. We're we're kind of your competitors, but we have a different way to monetize our content. And I mean, there's big big things like. Uh, you know, several editors that I've been there over these major publications and they're being recruited to Dropbox, to Box, to Hyperloop. Like if any of you guys know these companies, you know these are like four or five of the top editors out there have gone to these different startups and companies. So it's just interesting what's going to happen with that the transition. I, I, I agree with, with that, John. I, I think it is interesting. I think a lot of the answer to, or some of the answers, Uber to what you just said. Um, but I also can't deny that there's something about a culture to me that is just hugely important. And I don't care uh, whether we're talking about 2017 or 2020 or, or 1950. There's something about a shared set of values and a way that people interact with each other that make content and content creators seem better to me. A lot of them are individual actors who, who work on their own, but there's something about having a culture and uh, something to rally around that's, that's good, and I'm afraid a little bit that we're gonna lose some of that if everybody's working from home. I 100% agree. Don't say I agree with it, but I, uh, I agree with what you're saying. We will lose that. Got a question, so I'm gonna get up here and walk over here. Well, a question or maybe musing, I guess. I mean, I think one question is, is everybody working at home 100%? We're seeing a lot of yeah. people coming into some kind of central place a couple days a week, a couple days a month, working more from home. And I think I wonder among about those people identifying as freelancers, is that 100% of their time or is it more? I do think 
I just but, read the statistic. I, I didn't make it. <laughs> no, I, I would imagine most of those fit into that. And right. I think freelancers also the work from home, you know, I would classify myself as a work from home freelancer. But I have my own company. We're a large company. We have an office, but just nobody goes into that office. Better snacks, maybe. <laughs> Actually, we do have really good snacks oh, there. Okay. They just like they just pile up, and then I see like one guy running out with like a huge bag of them once a week. Or <laughs> no joke, I'm not joking on that. I think one of the challenges we've got as things evolve, right, is that the technology makes it easier to work from home. It's really important yeah. to have culture. You can use a lot of tools, you know, video conferencing and, and meeting, virtual meetings and all of that to do that. So then it gets back to what's the work and what's the economics of that, right? Because we can create the culture, we can give people flexibility. Um, and what I'm hearing a lot is that there's a lot of value there. And then there's also a need for transparency, right? If I'm writing about the homeless because it's important to understand the homeless issue, that's different than if I'm a home builder writing about housing, right? So what is the state of content? Is there too much out there? Is there too much bad stuff out there? And, and you have a lot of content. We do, we do. And I, I, I always think that there is a lot of content out there and uh, there's not a lot of journalism out there. There's a lot of opinion out there. I think that it's pretty damn important that somebody bear witness to some of the things that's going on and that journalism and reporting are, are becoming somewhat of a lost art and that maybe there's more opinion than, than we need. Um, but it, the, the good stuff seems to rise. I have found that the really good stuff does rise still. Not all of it, but the, uh, the stuff that I find would do very, very well in journalism and the truly amazing stories do rise. But not, I mean, I feel that amplification and what they used to get doesn't happen though. They used to rise and stay risen for days mm -hmm. and weeks. Now they rise for 15 minutes. <laughs> so there's, there was a, a theme that sort of has emerged throughout and that is relationships. Relationship with user, cu customer, consumer. Uh, what does that look like for each one of your organizations and, and how do you aim to improve it? What does the relationship look like between the customer and the mm -hmm. The writer? And, or your organization, yeah. Um, and how we aim to improve it. I think it's, uh, it's a lot of getting to know each other, getting to know what that brand's trying to accomplish, what that writer is good at. It's a lot of hit or miss. Some of the content is great, and it's a home run. Some isn't. A lot. Half the battle, though, and where news cred plays a role, is making sure that that content, when, once published, actually finds audience off network and brings it back into the brands, like what we call a content hub, because they build these and then nobody goes there <laughs> and the content doesn't get seen. So what we're trying to improve upon is, is actually maybe the journalists can help. Maybe they've got their own network. They can share it uh, on social, get it out there, drive audiences in, um, and then just get better, F figure out what works. And a lot of this is data driven. What about the story is performing? What, what are other stories like it that perform? And then feeding that data back into what the brand and writer are doing together. Does that answer your question? I think so. Okay. Well, as I said, the important relationships for us is between the company and the creators. We have lots of B2B revenue still, so not enough data about some of our customer relationships. All the websites where we do have data, it's, it's obviously rich stuff and we mine it and we try to figure out what people want. Sometimes it's trying to figure out uh, how to find other creators. We crowdsource uh, cartoonists right now and we've discovered some pretty interesting people through who like our stuff and then want to be cartoonists themselves. Um, I, I, I wish, uh, in, in some ways I think data could be overdriven, mm -hmm. um, but uh, I wish we had more. I wish as, as a company we had less B2B, more B2C, but that's happening. Are you seeing emergent pots of value that, that I mean, are those cyclical and, and are there some that are kind of rising? We talked about cookbooks, for instance, um, and, and about the, the pot. And in my household, anecdotal as it is, we have lots of cookbooks. That's, that's, a, that's a big value thing. Are you seeing emergent value pots emerging? So I, 
uh, got us out of cookbooks because they don't, oh, they don't, well, never they don't mind fit that. with what we right. do anymore. But um, I, I, I guess that the, the closer the consumer is to the author or the creator and, and the more they feel that relationship is close, clearly the, uh, the author's on to something and, and there's real authenticity in that. Other areas that are emergent though? Um, uh, poetry, I guess, has is, is been the most yeah. interesting one for us, and I know that's a funny thing to say, but it's, it, these are Instagram poets. Remember, these people all start by sharing their stuff socially, then they get together in small poetry slams or, or um, you know, ways that they connect with each other, and the publishing element is, is an outgrowth of that. It's a... Um, it, it's just, it works in so many different ways right now. It used to be one size fits all, and now it starts sometimes with data, and sometimes it starts with an editor, and sometimes it starts with a live event, and sometimes it starts online, and it just, what's really nice about it is the, the mix. Okay. How about emerging areas? Emerging content areas? Mm-hmm. Um, for us, it's all over the map. So it's, we work across multiple verticals. So I, I can't think of one consolidation. Well, that's, that's yeah. necessarily. I, I would say one uh, merging content area that uh, is semi actually undervalued, I mean, you guys do it, is syndication and working with other publications with uh, the proper tags to publish content on your site and then republish it on other people's uh, websites. We do that a lot and it's helped us grow um, not only our, our own brand but other people's brands as well because we're able to put that content on our site and then someone else's site and that site is transferred back to the authority. Again, that's what you guys do as a company but something highly not talked about by publications and a lot of publications that don't do that but the ones that do do it and work with others and grow that, I feel that those are emerging as some of the front runners because they go to other people and work with the best people out there and they put the best content from other people's sites that they're working with on their site and people don't recognize it as, oh, that actually appeared first on that site over there. No, they're getting the ad revenue here, sometimes a split, but they're recognizing that site as saying, oh, we have the best content in the world on our site and they, again, nobody realizes that that was actually on three other people's sites. They just recognize it on their site. I've had, I personally have written posts for different sites where the site where I originally published the article got like 10, 20,000 page views and then it got syndicated to another thing and I had one post do over a million page views in one day on another person's site and it wasn't originally published there. It was somewhere else. I've seen that so happen so many times. It's so like, undervalued and so many people don't give weight to that, that that's, I mean, we've been doing it for a long time, but I feel it's emerging as some of the biggest players out there are doing it. Yeah, I think I talked a lot about our original creation side of the business, but from the publishing standpoint, what we basically do there is smart packaging and syndication. So we, you guys, you represent maybe news publishers, the great hard-hitting journalism that you guys do is actually not the stuff that we play with. It's the, um, the softer side of the news or the lifestyle content. So if you think about every newspaper out there might have a great uh, DIY article on how to rebuild your closets or how to self-renovate your bathroom or just these pieces that they've done over the years and it's, it's been produced and it's been monetized directly and it's probably buried below the fold. But what NewsCred does is basically package that up with 20 other similar thematic articles from other publications around the world. And then we turn around and we license that to Home Depot. So Home Depot can basically have a DIY hub about all the great projects that you can do. Now, ultimately, the goal is to get them to buy things from Home Depot. But it, they want to be known as a thought leader on that t particular topic. So that's, that's a lot of how we syndicate licensed content. C can I give one more emerging one that is undervalued? Uh, using uh, syndicating again. Does anybody work and or put anything out on Medium? Does anybody do anything on Medium? We syndicate a lot of our uh, content on Medium. We become one of the top 25 publications. Dude, we're, we are a boring payments company. <laughs> Seriously, and we have one of the top 25 pay, like publications on Medium. And we ease, I mean, we had two months ago, we did 2.5 million page views on Medium. It's pretty good. 
So there, there had been an argument that curation was sort of yesterday's news. And what I'm hearing you say is, no, it's not. It's just different like SEO, you know, search engine optimization is different than it was three or four years ago. Would you agree with that? It is different. I mean, I think what we're doing is, is highly differentiated because it's not competing. It's not, we're not trying to be first. Our customers, they care about relevancy, not timeliness. No one's breaking news. No one's using that hard, hit co uh, that hard coding stuff. But every article that is syndicated has a canonical URL back to the original publisher. Um, so they are getting search credit for that. The publisher, we, we won't let our clients rank above our publishers for the stories. That's just the way it's done. So it's done in a, in a way where it's, it's being repurposed somewhere that's not a threatening channel. You're getting SEO credit and you're getting paid. It's getting monetized. So. And, and you're creating faster roads to success for a lot of the writers. So, so let's talk about sort of what the future is of that, of curation and of SEO and, and where you see that going. I think just player, I think it's more players will start emerging a lot quicker because they'll be able to, a new player will be able to merge a lot quicker because he can work and curate the best content on the internet and place it on his site and he never has to ever write an article ever like a good example, I'm not sure if they're still, do you guys read Drudge Report? Do they produce any of their own content? Maybe now they do a little bit, yeah. but yeah. I don't think they produce really any content, they but they curate them. some of the best content in the entire world and there's tens of millions if not, I don't know how they're exact, but a lot of people go to that type and similar type sites. I feel syndication is a very, very good thing and lots of players can you know, work with somebody like you guys or, you know, other companies or do it themselves and emerge a lot quicker. There's another great example of curation done well. I think it's, it's for a specific demographic that I happen to fall into, but the skim, I don't know if you guys know the skim, mm -hmm. they've become kind of a force in, in, and all they do is curate the best stuff, but they, they're, in, they're an email newsletter subscription, but they put their spin on every article in this, this voice that's very consistent and, and they're basically targeting women between, I don't know, 20 and 50 or something. I'm not sure what their exact demographic is, but they've built this extremely loyal audience that is highly desirable to advertisers. And now they're basically creating all these other revenue streams off of that. So curating books, curating wine, selling events, so selling sponsorships, and it's all just a newsletter and with links back to publishers. And I do think the last statistic I heard, they were driving significant amounts of traffic to the articles that they did curate. So just another interesting concept. The, the skim, the Drudge Report, all these things are brands. They have designs, they do have voices, mm -hmm. they do things really well, and they do reach specific audiences. In the case of Drudge, it's a huge audience. Yeah. A, 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 single, a single placement on Drudge can make a, a, a journalist day or, yeah. or month. Or month or year. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, so th those guys are truly important, but they are real brands now. But you notice they curate some of the best content out there. I mean, these yeah. guys, they curate yeah. the best. That's all they do. Like, they're good at that. But these are brands that have stood out and started, and that's been their voice. Again, not that's saying important. that's that necessarily the future, but that's one way that people can stand out. And it's also prof creating a profound impact from the, from the traditional content, cr content producers. So yeah. I, I worked for a while at ABC, and we played the drudge game. We knew what they wanted, we knew when to, we knew when to send it, we had their email address, and when we ever had a, a breaking scoop, we sent it to them. Because to your point, if we could be that first person, first link to put up there on a breaking story, it would literally make your day. Right. And to your point, he's creating a brand by himself simply by curating in a voice that he has, um, you know, other people's content. Right. Some of them are harder to game. Reddit, I find, is very hard to game and drudge easier, but, but yes, absolutely agree. I think one other potential future is personalization. So I, I'm sure a lot of you guys out here probably work with Microsoft and what they're trying to accomplish with MSN is now how to basically do personalization at scale for like a billion people globally. And their editorial team can literally program 5% of all the content that they have access to. So there's so much stuff that doesn't get on there. But when things hit the homepage of MSN, and we work with them on behalf of a bunch of our publishers, and I've seen it drive you know, tens of millions of page views from that placement. 
But so what they're trying to do now is do a, get a lot more content on there algor algorithmically and basically let every single user have a personalized experience. So when you come to that homepage, it's everything you want to see and not the same thing for everybody. And that's the goal is to drive more engagement, obviously. All right, one other future thing, video. Video is huge. We haven't really talked about it in content, content as much, in, at least in this panel. But yeah. uh, video does extremely well. And people like MSN and a few other people really crush it with video. And uh, I mean, I, when I'm writing content, I'll get lots of things where literally a publisher will come back to me 10 minutes after an article's read. And they'll be like, can you please record a 45 second video of yourself recapping this and giving four points from this? And I'm like, all right. And then they have my video and then the four points. And that video just, I mean, it'll look tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of views in minutes. And I feel the younger audience consumes that type of content a lot more than an older audience, say, would. Uh, but I feel, you know, again, going towards future and future trends, I think video will have more and more of an impact. Does anybody go on LinkedIn? You guys go on LinkedIn? How much do you see video now? It's like 80% 80, 80 of your feed, 70% of your feed. When you're scrolling down, it's all video. They didn't even have video on there, what, three months ago? And now it's a majority of your feed, at least it is of mine and most people I know. So it wasn't even on there a couple months ago. So if that shows the importance of video and some of these big players and big companies are putting towards it. Other trends that you're excited about or looking forward to that you're, you're preparing for? I'm just going to piggyback on that one and say for us, short form animation makes so much sense. And we are about to spend oodles of money developing short form animation and not translating existing static stuff into animation, but I know there are thousands and thousands of talented young animators out there who have no place to show off their short form animation and that we ought to be the company that brings them to the fore. And when you do that, um, where, where will you deliver that? Well, uh, the, the main consumer website right now is, is Go Comics, and there'll be a, an animation channel on Go Comics, but it'll be atomized. It'll be all over the place. We're partnering with, with Amazon and, and some of the other uh, you know, larger social players. I put mine up on YouTube and embedded in place in posts for SEO. It helps those rank a lot better in YouTube as long as you're putting the tags right and doing that right. If you can put a video with a really piece of content that's already ranking and then put a video, it will help that content rank better and it will help that video crush it in the YouTube when people are searching, which YouTube's the second largest search engine in the world. And any bit of technology that you're really excited about that you think is really going to change the way you do your jobs? For us, it's all, it's, we're doing a lot in AI, mm -hmm. um, machine learning, to have, having our editorial teams actually teach the machines how to program better algorithms. But for us, it's a lot of that, like surfacing the right content out of our huge repository for the right people. But um, there's some promising results, at least within our company. Technology-wise? No. And, and delivered to them where and how? So since we're B2B, this is basically delivering to our customers. Mm -hmm. But um, it's, Down the line? Yeah, exactly. Down the line. Eventually, when we, our plans are then to be able to basically take over their, their hubs and destinations, because they're frankly not very good. Um, and program those as well. So trans transferring that technology basically down the line. John? Uh, I like using a piece of software called BuzzSumo. Yeah. If you guys know BuzzSumo, it's a really good one. Uh, it basically analyzes the internet and you can search for keywords or trends on things that are actually starting to trend in the news, on social media and everything. We use it literally daily to create videos and we'll see if something we notice that it's gotten over 20,000 social shares in the past 45 minutes. I'm creating a video on that. I'll post that video on YouTube, and typically those videos will get 10 times more traffic, or if not, 1,000 times more traffic than anything else. So BuzzSumo is a really good one that I use. There's a couple other tools like it, but again, it analyzes what's tr starting to trend across the internet. If I can attach onto that, I can really be ahead of the curve on what's actually happening. What about augmented, mixed, Virtual, 
anything there? Especially like with animation? Yeah, yeah. There's lots of new tools that we're playing with and nothing that it's worth talking about, but absolutely. 